That's our call, Ian Murray. Thank you, Miss. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'm, I'm sorry you don't want an oratorial flourish, because that's what I was preparing to do. But never mind, we'll uh, continue with the debate. I do appreciate that the debate has been curtailed, and what's an incredibly important because of the Prime Minister's statement uh, today, which we have to uh, accept the way this, uh, this House works in that uh, particular circumstance. But it is a pleasure to open today's Opposition Day debate for the Opposition. And it, at its core, this is a debate about the transfer of new powers to Scotland under the Scotland Bill, which completed its passage through this House last November and is currently in the other place. It is worth briefly reflecting, Madam Deputy Speaker, on the Scotland Bill itself to put this debate about Scotland's public finance and the fiscal framework into context. The Scotland Bill has its genesis in the VOW and the Smith Commission, the recommendations of which were agreed by all five major Scottish political parties. When passed, the Bill will transform the Scottish Parliament to one of the most powerful devolved parliaments in the world. Scotland will have control over tax, income tax, all of income tax, apart from non-savings and non-dividends income, which generated almost £11 billion in revenues in the year 2013-14. The Scottish Parliament will have the power to vary the rates and bands of income tax to either increase or decrease those revenues. This greatly enhances the powers devolved under the Scotland Act 2012, under which the Scottish Parliament controls just 10 pence in the pound. And on that note, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Scottish Labour leader, Kezia Dugdale, announced yesterday that, faced with a choice of cutting into Scotland's future or using the powers of the Scottish Parliament, We have chosen to use the powers of the Scottish Parliament to set the Scottish rate of income tax in the debate that was happening in the Scottish Scottish Parliament today at 11p rather than the 10p that is in the S&P budget to invest in that very future for Scotland and indeed protect the low paid as well. And these new revenue raising powers are accompanied by new spending powers such as control over £202.5 billion of welfare. The Scottish Parliament will be able to top up existing UK benefits, and thanks to concerted pressure from this side of the House and indeed the amendments put forward by myself and my honourable friends, it will have total autonomy to create new benefits in devolved areas. When these new powers are enacted, the Scottish Parliament will be able to make different choices to create a better Scotland. However, before this happens, I'm happy to give way to the honourable gentleman. I'm very grateful. Could he just tell the House who in his party speaks for England to make sure that the settlement would also be fair to England as well as Scotland? Well, this, the settlement does have to be fair uh, to England as well as the rest, uh, the, the rest of the United Kingdom, including England as well as Scotland. And I'll come on to that uh, in the later part of my contribution. I'm grateful to my very honourable friend for giving way. We hear of cheers in the Scottish Parliament this afternoon as the finan- finance minister tried to justify expenditure cuts in, uh, in public expenditure, cuts backed by the Tories. Is this not the final proof that the socialist credentials that the SNP tried to claim have? No foundation whatsoever. Well, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for that intervention because what we have seen this afternoon in Scotland is a Scottish Labour Party determined to use the current powers of the Scottish Parliament to try and do something different from Conservative austerity. And the result of that is a Scottish Finance Minister and a Scottish Government just managing that Conservative austerity. And as I've said earlier, when left faced with a choice of either managing the Tory austerity or creating a different future for Scotland, we have chosen to create uh, that different future. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I I was um, just explaining the principles behind the Scotland Bill. Um, However, before the Scotland Bill can be enacted, they must be underpinned by a new fiscal framework for Scotland. This is running alongside the legislative process of the Bill, which is slightly different to what happened with the Scotland Act in 2012. It is also crucially important to state that the Smith Commission stipulated that the Barnett formula would be retained as a mechanism for determining Scotland's block grant. That is not in question in this debate. But Scotland's block grant will need to be adjusted to reflect both the new tax raising powers and new expenditure responsibilities that are being devolved, and that is at the heart of today's debate. Until that revised framework is agreed by the UK and Scottish Governments, the Scotland Bill cannot be enacted and the new powers and responsibilities it transfers cannot be implemented. We need a negotiated agreement in order to move on, otherwise the new powers will lie dormant and Scotland's financial position in the future will remain very uncertain. I am happy to give way. He mentioned, uh, he mentioned the Barnett formula and the vow, and of course he is right that it will be retained, uh, but he will also be aware that the Barnett formula is not based on relative need and therefore is not fair to England and in particular to Wales. In fact. Uh, would he then, therefore, as a party of the left, support reform of the Barnet formula to make it more progressive for the whole island? 
Well, there is consensus across this entire chamber that the Barnett formula stays in place. It was in the vow that was signed by all the major party political leaders that went into the general election. The Smith Agreement has been signed by all five political uh, parties, and that includes the maintenance of the Barnett formula. And I think it is important when the honourable gentleman from the Conservative backbenches wants to re- renew and, and review the Barnett formula that that means that it is only the Labour Party in this chamber that will defend the Barnett formula, because the policy it would seem from the backbenches of the Conservative parties to do away with Barnett, and the policy of the Scottish National Party for full c- fiscal autonomy, which also does away with the Barnett formula. So we will defend the Barnett formula because it is in the interests of of our constituents uh, to do so. I am um, happy to give way to the Honourable Gentleman again, b- bearing in mind that the, the debate is very much curtailed. I do not want to do away with the Barnet formula. I would just like to see the Barnet formula uh, uh, revised so it is based on relative needs, because that seems to me to be a very fair way forward. But the Barnet formula is based on that need. That is why it was designed in the 1970s, to take into account the contribution that Scotland makes to the United Kingdom, but also the contribution in terms of the public service requirements, the geographical nature uh, of Scotland. That is why it was put in place. It has broad political uh, consensus, and I do not think we should break that political consensus uh, of the Barnet formula. I think it would be a very difficult uh, message to, to send out. So the message from today, Madam Deputy Speaker, is it is the job of the Scottish and UK Government Ministers to get a deal. We are heard today that the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, who I am delighted is in his place, is to be in Edinburgh for talks all day on Monday. The people of Scotland will expect nothing less than a final deal that is signed, sealed and delivered. We support the Scottish Government in their efforts to reach an agreement that is fair, equitable and consistent with the Smith Agreement. Again, that is not in question. But reach an agreement they must. I am happy to give way. Surely, before the Scottish referendum, Scottish people were promised these extra devolved power. Won't people be extremely disappointed with all this shallying around and failure to come to an agreement after 18 months? So why we have called this Opposition Day debate, and I will come on to very quickly uh, the issues around timescales and what should have been delivered by now, but nobody will forgive us in Scotland or indeed across the US United Kingdom for breaking the promise of getting these powers, uh, these powers through so that the Scottish Parliament can choose a different course if it so wishes uh, than the rest of the uh, United uh, Kingdom. So I was saying, Madam Deputy Speaker, reach an agreement they must. I believe there is broad consensus on this point across the Chamber that an agreement must be reached. Indeed, the SNP Chair of the Scottish Affairs Select Committee, the member for Perth and North Perthshire, I am delighted he is in his place, has also said that and I quote, he wants assurances that a deal will be reached in time. And we do not agree on very much, but we certainly agree on that particular point. Few people will understand if both governments walk off the job before it is done and start the blame game. In making this point and speaking to today's motion, there are two key issues that I want to highlight and discuss. Firstly, concerns about the secretive nature in which these negotiations have been conducted and the consistent refusal of both governments to publish any meaningful papers and minutes from the Joint Executive Committee meetings. This I'm happy to give it. I didn't mean to interrupt my honourable friend's uh, flow. He's making um, a very important speech. The Communities and Local Government Select Committee today has published an important report, not about Scottish devolution, but English devolution, but highlighting a major criticism, which is the lack of openness about deal negotiations. And does my honourable friend share my concerns that the government seem to be operating in an underhand way in relation to these negotiations also? I do agree with my uh, honourable friend. This seems to be very much the way this government operates in terms of the debate we've just had around taxation issues and indeed uh, about the devolution settlements that the local government committee uh, has published today. And I think it's important that we have transparency because the only way you can carry the public with you on these very fundamental issues of devolution to local communities is to make sure it's transparent, robust uh, and indeed democratic. And that takes me to my second concern, which is what this Opposition Day Day is about, and that is the need to agree the framework so that the Scotland Bill can be passed in time for the Scottish parliamentary elections in May. Uh, For months now, the negotiations have dragged on behind closed doors and the Joint Exchequer Committee, shielded from public scrutiny. Yet, according to the Scottish Government sources, agreement is as far off as it has ever been, whilst the tone of the Secretary of State is to strain every sinew to get a deal. 
This was always the danger, that away from the spotlight, the two governments would fiddle and fixate and the momentum to reach a deal would be lost. And so it has proved. And this answers my hon. Friend's uh, intervention from earlier. Firstly, agreement was going to be reached by the autumn. The Scottish Secretary consistently referred to an autumn deadline. So did the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. So did the Deputy First Minister in Scotland. But no agreement materialised. Then it was mid-February. And in mid-December, the First Minister talked up the prospects of a Valentine's Day deal. But come January, her deputy, Mr Swinney, struck a downbeat note emphasising the big gap between the two governments. He also introduced an arbitrary deadline of the 12th of February for a deal on the fiscal framework. If negotiations were not concluded by then, he would not put down a legislative consent motion prior to the Scottish Parliament's dissolution for those elections in May. I have yet to find out why this is the case when the Scottish Parliament does not dissolve until late March. No agreement effectively kicks the the Scotland Bill into the long grass. It would mean no new powers for the foreseeable future. For all that, I remain confident if the political will exists, a deal can be reached. However, to test that political will, we need to bring the negotiations out into the open. Let the public see if this is brinksmanship or indeed a proper negotiation. From the very beginning, I have bemoaned the absence of transparency at the heart of these negotiations. It is simply not acceptable that the process of redrawing Scotland's fiscal terrain has taken place behind closed doors in vapour-filled rooms. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend. And uh, does he agree with me that one of the key reasons why it's important uh, that the deal is done before the Scottish parliamentary elections is so that the Scottish electorate can have some confidence of the promises that are being made by the political parties in terms of their spending plans and their taxation plans? And does he also uh, agree that there is great interest across the rest of the United Kingdom because of the asymmetric nature of devolution? We want to see how Scotland uses these powers. My honourable friend is absolutely right, because without having the Scotland Bill on the statute book available to be used uh, from the 1st of April 2017, there will be obfuscation in terms of what can go into party manifestos come May, and we will be having a constant debate about the Constitution rather than about the transformation of Scotland. But he is also right to suggest that this is not just a fiscal framework for Scotland. Whilst it is important to run in parallel with the Scotland Bill, Actually, this has significant implications for the rest of the United Kingdom, and the no detriment principle for Scotland works both ways. It's also a no detriment principle for the rest of the United Kingdom, and that's something that's often lost in these particular uh, discussions. And from the very beginning, I was saying, Madam Deputy Speaker, I've bemoaned the absence of transparency, and it's simply not acceptable that the process of redrawing the Scotland's fiscal terrain is taking place behind closed doors. And David Bell, the respected economist, has noted the secretive nature of these discussions. As well. He said, and I quote, These discussions are taking place behind closed doors with little information publicly available about the options being considered and the effect of these options. Asked to offer his thoughts on these proceedings, Professor Muscatelli said, and I quote, I will be honest, it is difficult for anybody on the outside to see what exactly the stumbling block in these negotiations is. Even the chair again of the Scottish Affairs Select Committee, this might be the second time uh, we have agreed, said that the negotiations and the transparency at the heart of those negotiations, and I quote, are not good enough. I also warmly welcome the Scottish Affairs Select Committee's inquiry uh, into this issue and the in-depth inquiry that they will uh, publish soon. I would ask why both governments refuse to publish papers and minutes, as has been requested. On the 9th of September, I wrote to the chairs of the Joint Exchequer Committee, John Swinney, and the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, uh, with a perfectly reasonable request to ask them to publish papers and minutes from the meetings. They refused. I also tabled written and oral questions to ask that we be kept updated of the progress of negotiations and that substantial details of the discussions be placed in the public domain. Once again, my request was rejected. Both governments said they would not provide, and I quote, a running commentary on the negotiations, whilst providing the very running commentary they said they would not do, but through the media. Meanwhile, people in Scotland are very much in the dark. And that has allowed politicians on both sides to seek to exploit the secrecy rather than get on with finalising the deal. I'm happy to give way. I thank my friend for giving way. Does that also trouble my friend? Because it goes back to the very principles of the Smith Commission itself. Pillar 1 explicitly said that one of the challenges faced in this new constitutional settlement was to have a much more stronger and more transparent parliamentary scrutiny of the work, and particularly identifying the Joint Exchequer Committee. If we can't get it right now, what hope do we have for the future? 
That's a timely intervention, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, because in actual fact, when everyone talks about making sure the Smith Agreement is delivered in spirit and in substance, they tend to forget the bits of the substance that's inconvenient for them to remember. And that is one, the Joint Exchequer Committee has not been transparent, and one of the key planks of the Smith Agreement was also intergovernmental relations. And without that transparency, we can't see if intergovernmental relations are actually working. And one of the key things about the whole devolution project, whether it be in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, or the discussions that are currently going on with regard regards to England is to make sure that all the components of that devolved uh, body, the United Kingdom, can work together and work together in partnership. And if I could just draw a comparison uh, with these negotiations, with the fiscal framework the negotiations that sat alongside the Scotland Act of 2012. And to prove it, here's the minutes of the first meeting of the Scotland Act of 2012. That was the 27th of September 2011. It's a dusty tomb of information. It gives attendances, it gives points that were discussed, things that were agreed, things that were to come back to be agreed. Let's contrast that with the minutes or the communiques from the discussions of this year's. Let me give you a flavour of the 1st of February. The Joint Exchequer Committee met in London today, chaired by the Deputy First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitutional Economy and the HM Treasury's Chief Secretary of the Treasury. This was the eighth meeting of the GEC since the publication of the Smith Commission. The Minister continued their discussions. Both Ministers agreed to meet next week. <laughs> 21st of January 2015. Again, it introduces who was at the meeting with their very long titles. It says this was the seventh meeting of the Joint Exchequer Committee since the publication of the Smith Commission report. The Ministers continued their discussion on the indexation methodologies for the block grant adjustments and also discussed the initial transfer of funding for new welfare powers. Both Ministers agreed to meet again shortly. It goes on, Madam Deputy Speaker, with less than a third of a page, two paragraphs of minutes. I am not sure that having no details or no substance in there is acceptable. And the reason it is not acceptable is because the Scottish Government has threatened to veto the bill if, and I quote, it is not fair to Scotland. The problem is we do not know what, in their opinion or the Government's, is fair, a fair deal for Scotland and what that looks like. And we do not know in what way the current deal on offer from the UK Government is deficient in that test of fairness. It would appear that the main stumbling block regards the method used for the future indexation of the block grant. Of the methods being considered, the Scottish Government now favours the per capita index deduction. People can go to the library and find out what that is. I will not explain it uh, at this particular juncture. <laughs> However, less than a year ago, the Deputy First Minister... I, ca I, I can go through the formula, if you like. And I'm sure we'll get, if we can get an answer... I will give a prize if you can get the answer at the end. However, less than a year ago, the Deputy First Minister told the Scottish Parliament's first Finance Committee that he favoured the index deduction, which takes into account population growth. So there is clearly some confusion over which method is best for Scotland, and that is why transparency of discussions is incredibly important. Um, happy to give way. And that the Labour Party are feeling a bit sad about not being involved in these negotiations because they haven't been successful enough to be in government in either country. Um, can he please tell us, now he's getting the opportunity to have his say, can he please tell us what method of block grant adjustment the Labour Party favours? Yeah. Well, we don't know because we've not seen the negotiations, but well, if you let me answer, answer the, uh, the, the if you let me answer the question, we have not seen the negotiations, but we prefer the per capita index deduction model, and that is what my leader in the Scottish Labour Party has said, because it is important that we have uh, that particular uh, debate. And it is strange that the uh, issue of the, uh, the, the, the intervention is given. That it seems as if we are being locked out. It is not the Labour Party that is being locked out of the discussion. It is the Scottish people that is being locked out. And that is why we have had this debate, to try and put some uh, light onto these very secret discussions uh, indeed. I noticed with the, interv the intervention of the Honourable Lady, she did not tell us whether or not she supports doing something in Scotland with the powers they currently have, or whether or not she is willing just to manage Conservative uh, austerity. I'm happy to give way. I'm just a little for giving way again. Uh, does he agree with me that there are some amazing parallels between these negotiations and those of the Prime Minister and his EU negotiations? <laughs> we were kept totally in the dark all along, and then we found out there was nothing to see anyway. <laughs> 
Well, absolutely, and I suspect that's perhaps what part of the problem is in here. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, so let me just quickly wrap up by paying some attention, if I may, to the uh, SNP uh, amendment um, that's been selected in the name of the leader of the uh, SNP. Um, I, I can't quite fathom why they've decided to try and amend what is our very uncontentious motion. And I thought we could probably work together uh, on this important issue, given that we share the same goals for a fair deal uh, for Scotland. Our motion merely reflects the views that have also been expressed by the Chair of the Scottish Affairs Select Committee. I have got an absolutely no problem at all with the SNP amendment as it is written, but it is a wrecking amendment, as it would completely replace everything we are asking for in our amendment. I wish they had placed this amendment as an addendum, and we could have gone forward with consensus together. The purpose of this debate is to get transparency and to ensure a fair deal is done, and I would have thought they would have agreed with that. Um, I welcome it is a step forward, in fact, that they now are defenders of the Barnet formula. As a few months ago, they were voting in this chamber with the Conservatives to scrap the Barnet formula with full fiscal autonomy. But it does pose the question if they are really interested at all in getting these particular uh, issues resolved. Madam Deputy Speaker, let me finish uh, just by talking a little bit about the democratic deficit, which was the second plank at the heart of these negotiations. We have to close that de democratic deficit. The Scotland Bill is much too important for us not uh, to do that. And I wonder if I could just conclude by posing a few questions uh, to the Secretary of State that I hope he is either able to answer in his uh, opening remarks or his colleague uh, from the Treasury may be able to um, answer in the conclusion of this debate. The Chief Secretary to the Treasury announced today he will be in Scotland for more talks on Monday. What is the Secretary of State's aspirations for that meeting, and is a deal expected at those talks? Does the Secretary of State recognise the 12th of February as a final deadline, and what will happen if a deal is not reached by that date? Will negotiations continue, regardless of dissolution and the Scottish parliamentary elections? Will the Secretary of State publish the final offers from both parties for transparency purposes so the public can determine whether or not these were good deals for Scotland, and has consideration been given to agreeing a deal for a trial period that would allow assessment and adjust them. Our motion urges both governments to work together and stay at the table until a deal is agreed. Our motion also calls upon the UK Government to publish all minutes and papers from the Joint Exchequer Committee. And I commend our motion to the House. Yeah.